the schedule on a liveaboard is pretty hectic. You wake up at like 6 a.m. every day, your briefing starts at 6.30, then you're in the water diving by like 7, 7.30, and then you come back and have breakfast, small rest, dive, lunch, small rest, dive, dinner, <laughs> and then in between all that, you have to continue to charge all the cameras and find some time to chill as well. So it's incredible, but it is hectic. Today, we are headed to Jellyfish Lake, which is one of about 70 lakes located inside the Rock Islands, five of which have jellyfish, but only one of which was open for visitors. So basically they were formed when uh, the sea level was higher and it came into the islands through like fissures and over ridges, filled it all up, and now that the sea level has gone back down again, the water has stayed, but it's still connected to the ocean. So the lakes inside are actually tidal, which is pretty crazy. The name of the one we're going to today is, I'm not gonna say this right, Ongemai Tiktao. Ongemai Tiktao. Yeah. The lake itself is about 100 feet deep, but all of the life is above 45 feet because, um, over the years, since it's been in a closed system, everything that's died sinks to the bottom of the lake and it produces hydrogen sulfide. So if you go below 45 feet, you'll actually get uh, poisoned. It's like a half a mile hike to get there. We have to hike over a ridge. So that should be interesting to hike with our dive housings over a ridge. <laughs> It'll be fun. Okay. Now we get a workout. Ugh. Get to carry our housings. I think up 80 stairs, down 50, something like that. So get a little arm pump going here. Oh, they're big steps. They're big steps. <laughs> Cameras are heavy. Hey guys. I don't think you're ready for this jelly. I don't think you're ready for this jelly. I don't think you're ready. Cause my body's so jellyless, just for you, baby. <laughs> nice. It was kind of creepy jumping into a lake that you knew if you dove deep enough you'd get poisoned from the hydrogen sulfide soaking into your skin, and that that poison was created by the billions of dead jellyfish who were born, lived their entire life, and died in this lake before sinking to the bottom. Jellyfish have two alternating life stages, the polyp and the medusa. The medusa is the mature version of the jellyfish, whose larva turns into the second stage, a polyp, which in turn releases their own larva that morph back into the medusa. If you've ever seen one of these while diving, you may not have realized it's actually a jellyfish in its polyp form. When in this medusa stage, jellyfish can eat two different ways. One is by using their stinging tentacles to capture zooplankton, and the other is from the symbiotic algae that live in their tissues. The jellies ensure that the algae get enough sunlight for photosynthesis. In turn, the algae give the jellyfish energy and nutrients. This means that every day, the jellyfish migrate across the lake to chase the sun and maximize the amount of sunshine they can get their algae hitchhikers. Oh. 
How'd it go? It's so bizarre. What the fuck? How is it? I felt like I was in outer space actually. <laughs> so crazy swimming up to him and and yeah, when you're out in the ocean and, and you see jellyfish, you generally don't get close to it because their tentacles are like meters and meters long and then that's what stings you. But here, they don't have really long tentacles, so they don't have anything, any poison that, that can sting you. Uh, so you can swim right up to them and like hold the camera at them and like swim under them. It's so cool to see. And I did see a golden one. Oh, you did? Saw a, a lonely one golden jelly out there just floating around, Girl. swimming. It's crazy to think, I mean, this is, it's, it's like cold on top because it just rained, maybe this much. But then, you know, even when I was sticking my hand down, it feels like a hot tub down below. So it's probably like 94 degrees or something. So too hot for them right now, but I um, can't imagine what it would be like when it was, when there's five million or six million jellyfish in this lake. I don't know how many there are right now, but a reason to come back to plow in the future when jellyfish lake is fully restocked. This episode is brought to you by Sundays for Dogs. When we first got Sharky, we were feeding a regular kibble until we realized how processed it was and all the negative effects it was having on her. It's basically like if I were to eat fast food all day, every day. That's when we started exploring healthier options, but they all took up a ton of space in our freezer or were a mess to prepare. And then we found Sundays for Dogs, which unlike other fresh dog food brands, doesn't require refrigeration because of their air drying process. This is fresh dog food made from a short list of human grade ingredients. 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Sharky is obsessed with this food. We immediately noticed that her coat got softer, her energy levels increased, and all that bad breath completely disappeared. So make the healthy choice for your dog and the easy choice for you. Get 50% off by going to sundaysfordogs.com forward slash cruisers or just use the code cruisers in the coupon box. Click the link below to get more info and back to the episode. Later that evening, we got to have a beach party on one of the most beautiful, remote, and seemingly random islands we'd ever been to. Is it cheese wrapped in dough and bacon? I think it's white bread with the, cut, with the crust cut off with squares of American cheese inside wrapped in bacon and baked. Nice. It's the real deal. Real interesting. Are you time lapsing with the drone? Mm hmm. Nice. It's actually really nice that the last couple days have been cloudy because the heat is pretty extreme here. I think it was in the 90s the first couple days, and I don't know the humidity level, but it's gotta be like 80 or 90%, right? Yeah. It's super hot. So hot. So it was kinda nice. It rained all day yesterday, and that doesn't really affect our diving. And today it's like cloudier, so it's actually cooler. And uh, I actually love the color of the water when it's cloudy, because when it's totally bright outside, full exposed sun, I mean, the water's beautiful but when it's contrasted against these dark gray skies and, and storm clouds, While the skies put on a mesmerizing show for sunset, it made us wonder about the first people who called Palau home and what it would have been like for them to arrive to these islands after many weeks or even months at sea. Though the origin of the Palauan people is shrouded in folklore and legend, it's primarily believed that the first people of Palau arrived a few thousand years ago in outrigger canoes. These seafarers migrating from Indonesia, New Guinea, Malaysia, Polynesia, and the Philippines must have thought they found heaven when they reached the fertile land and reefs of Palau and found no need to explore further. 
Between that time and now, Palau's geographical location has played a critical role and taken a massive hit from international politics and war, which we'll explore further when we dive some of the many World War II wrecks that Palau's famous for. But we wanted to speak to a local who could share with us what it meant to be Palauan and how the culture was faring in this modern day age. Luckily, when we had been in Karor, some friends of friends had linked us up with a local legend named Malahi. So how do you how do you mostly spend your time living on Palau? Living in Palau, <coughs> I work as a tour guide and a lot of people we get to work in the gardens and we go out fishing. Yeah, women we go out fishing. And we also uh, do farming. And uh, we have a lot of uh, um, cultural things that we do on the weekends, like funerals, first child ceremony. But it's a nice, a beautiful place. It's not very, very developed yet. And that's, we're hoping that we don't develop it too much. Because we find it, as you get older, that a lot of people, we really prefer to live where the nature is up there. A lot of trees and stuff around instead of big buildings and paved roads. Yes, so we're hoping, hoping that Palau will stay as beautiful as it is. Uh, We have a lot of um, foreigners, investors that wants to come and build a golf course and clear the place. There's golf course everywhere. Palauans, we have this word like, um, land is your mother. So, and we really believe if you don't take care of your mother, you're going to get cursed. We really believe that. So a lot of land that they have listed out, they start developing something and all of a sudden everything just falls. It's, uh, it's like a big thing like, oh, they're cursed. You shouldn't be doing that. You should take care of your land and pass it to your kids because it was, fr- because Palau is a very Christian country. We really believe in Bible and we're all Christian. We really believe if you take care of people, they take care of you. We believe if you take care of your nature, the nature takes care of you. And now with the economy that's getting so bad, we're really finding it that if you're doing fishing and farming and maintain it, it's good. Because if not, then we'll be buying all the foreign things and canned food and yeah. unhealthy way of life. Yeah, it's like I remember when I was young and they complained in Guam like they don't speak their language anymore. And I said, oh, that's bad. And now it's happening over here. A lot of our young people speak English. I think it's because of all the television and internet and stuff like that. Yeah, like my grandchildren, they come I'm like, now you have broken English and broken Palawan. You need to speak one language. Yeah, so we're hoping that we won't lose our language. We won't lose our people, our culture. So if you could say a message that all of the world would see and you could tell them something about Palau, what would you like them to know? Oh, i like everybody, everybody to know that Palau is beautiful. We welcome everybody to see us and we welcome them to come and take the picture and leave their footprints and go. And tell everybody, when they, whoever that they meet back home, to tell more people about us to come and visit us. Beautiful. Anything else? That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so well, our time aboard. That was great. That was perfect. While our time aboard the Black Pearl was a far cry from the life of Malahi's ancestors, it was nice knowing that we had her blessing to explore these islands. The clans of Palau have always understood the importance of conservation and for thousands of years have practiced something called bull when the Council of Chiefs places reef areas off limits to fishing during spawning and feeding periods. This traditional method of ecosystem conservation ensures that no fish population can be taken out during its vulnerable time, and has proven to show that it keeps the reefs and its residents healthy in the long run. The success of this symbiotic relationship is based on the responsibility that each Palawan is taught from childhood, that they are the caretakers of the sea. This deeply rooted cultural concept has transformed into modern day legislation, with Palau creating its first wildlife preserve in 1956 and the first ever shark sanctuary in the world in 2009. 
This action has since inspired 16 more shark sanctuaries that protect 7 million square miles of ocean. In Palau, it's more than just a saying. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children, which is something we all have room to take a lesson on from Palauans. But even so, there's no way for this tiny island nation to escape the global effects of rising water temperatures. And we did see bleaching even in the healthiest of coral reefs. In the next episode, we'll explore what this coral bleaching actually comes from and what it means, as well as share a truly wild dive in another Palawan cave, this one filled with stalactites and stalagmites. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like or a comment and consider becoming a patron. Or if you're itching for your own offshore sailing adventure, head over to our website to check out our cruising course schedule for the 2024-2025 season. Whether you want to join for a longer trip like a Sea of Cortez crossing and spend 10 days aboard with Captain Brady, or you want an easier one week round trip island hopping adventure out of Baja, we have you covered. We also have women's only courses led by Captain Heather Richard and a ton of other trips varying in length, price, and crew, which can all be found at our website. Thank you so much for watching to the end and see you next time.